The centerpiece of Toni Morrison's Nobel Lecture, its narrative crux, as I call it, is the place where she revises the Tower of Babel story. Now, I call it the narrative crux because as she takes up and she reinterprets this founding myth of human language, um, I hear her calling us to transform the way that we view language and the way that we use language with each other. And to really understand uh, what she's doing here, I think we need to look back at this Tower of Babel story. We need to look back at this founding myth and uh, to, well, to understand it in its proper, in its, in its original context. And that's by considering it in terms of the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe or ancient Hebrew cosmology. In terms of ancient Hebrew cosmology, the earth was flat uh, like this here, was built on the, well, the foundations of the earth, and above it was a dome. So it was kind of like a snow globe. About On the outside of the snow globe, there were waters, there were windows and doors of heaven through which the water came, the sun, the moon, the stars all moved across this dome in the sky. And now, after the flood, after the flood narrative in, in the Hebrew Bible, um, the people were called to multiply and replenish the earth, so to bring it to its full fruition, really, to propagate the species they needed to spread out from the place where they had landed and, well, to just repopulate the earth after it had been decimated. Now, there was a particular group of people who they decided to gather together and they wanted to build a city and at the center of the city, they wanted to build a tower. And what they wanted was to build a name for themselves. That's what the uh, Hebrew Bible says. They wanted to build a name for themselves. Now, most cities, they would have had a temple at their center. That's where they would have worshipped on the top of this. But they, as the conventional wisdom of the Tower of Babel goes, the uh, traditional interpretation of this myth is that they built a tower because they wanted to get to heaven. Now again, in terms of Hebrew, ancient Hebrew cosmology, Sheol was the place of the dead. Uh, people didn't go to heaven when they died, they came down here. Heaven was the place of God and the angels. So again, in terms of this common interpretation, they built the temple because, or they built this tower because they wanted to storm the heavens and to usurp God's power. They wanted to make it a place for themselves where they could be among God and the angels. God wasn't happy with this, and so he decided to go down and to punish them. And the way that he punished them was not to destroy the tower, but instead he confounded the language of the people, and he dispersed them throughout the earth. So they couldn't communicate with each other, uh, they couldn't understand one another, and because of this, again, as the common interpretation goes, they couldn't work together to finish building the tower to heaven. And hence we have the, uh, one of the founding myths of the, of the origin of human language. At least in terms of uh, Western culture, this is the founding myth. That it was a punishment for uh, human ambition. And, and that's really what it is. They, God punished them by confounding their languages. So oftentimes I think people view linguistic diversity as something that is bad. It's, it's a punishment for our wanting to you know, get to heaven. And what we need to do is get back to what Morrison calls a monolithic language. One universal tongue whereby we could all communicate with each other. Now, outside of the challenges that maintaining any kind of universal language would pose, um, there's a way well, there, one way of looking at this is that this linguistic diversity is the thing that keeps us vital. Morrison points out that we should view heaven not as post-life, not as this place where we're all the same as common conceptions of heaven have it, where everyone walks around with white robes and we look the same and we think the same and we talk the same language, etc., etc. That, for her, is not heaven. That's not paradise for her. Paradise for her is the conditions on the earth, the things that make life vital, the things that make it happen. Because for life to continue here 
on the earth, it needs diversity. Organisms cannot propagate without genetic diversity. Any gene pool that becomes too narrow, uh, or any species gene pool that becomes too narrow, that species runs the risk of being decimated. It will not be able to propagate any longer. So we need diversity. We need biodiversity for life on Earth to continue. Hence, she argues that we should view heaven as life. It's complicated, demanding, yes, because we have other languages, other views, other narratives, and it can be challenging to interact with people that don't share the same view as you do, who don't speak the same language, or who don't build their lives on the same myths that you do. But this diversity is vital, because once again, diversity is the only way that life can continue. When different ideas, different stories come together and interact, that is very rich, productive space. Narrative is radical, she says, because it is generative. Um, uh, it's, it's sublime because generative. It's radical. It, it creates us at the very moment that it's being created. So we need linguistic diversity. We need diversity of stories. We need diversity of views to make life really happen here. And this is what more I hear Morrison calling us to do, to establish conditions here on Earth um, where we give different stories their, their hearing where we seek to understand each other, where we seek not for one monolithic, one founding myth for everyone, one myth to rule them all, but where we give place for other views, for many views, for many stories, and where we reach out for those stories. We don't sequester ourselves away from them, but we intentionally get outside of ourselves and look for these different views and interact with people who share different ideas than we do. This is where I hear, well, in this section, I hear a very clear call from her for us to transform the way that we view and the way that we use language. And this idea from the narrative crux is one thing that carries through and that uh, defines her entire narrative. So keep that in mind as you're looking back at what she says in in her Nobel lecture.